Charleston County Criminal Justice Coordinating Council has a new director after founding director Christy Danford retired last year. Today, I talk one-on-one -on -one with new director Ellen Steinberg for this edition of Quentin's Post-Ups. And if you haven't already, subscribe to my YouTube channel and like Quentin's Post-Ups on Facebook. Judge Ellen Steinberg, welcome to Quentin's Post-Ups. Thank you so very much. I am thrilled to be here with you this morning. Oh, I appreciate it greatly. You know, me and you met earlier this month at the Charleston County Council swearing in at the beginning of the month. We did. Yes, indeed. And I know that you became the uh, new uh, Charleston County Criminal Justice Coordinated Council uh, uh, chair, of course, on August 12, 2012. I mean, 2020, 2022, that is. <laughs> and prior to the, obviously this role, you, you obviously were a magistrate judge. You worked as an assistant solicitor for the Ninth Circuit. You also were an assistant public defender, a family court attorney, a prosecutor for the Department of Services, Social Services, and a teacher for the paralegal department of Trident Tech. Let me ask you this. <laughs> now that you're in this new role, I, go for it. I was just going to say, I, I, it sounds like I have been around forever. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, when I, when I hear that and, and people say, you know, you've done this and this and this and, you know, what am I doing sitting over here as director of the CJCC? Um, you know, it was an incredible opportunity that I did not see coming. Mm. It was, it was really not in my plans. And, um, it's, it's a big shift. I've been a lawyer. I've been a judge. Now I'm a director of this incredible council, um, and I, I'm privileged. I will be the first one to say it. And Judge, let me ask you, with all your legal experience, how do you shift in a very successful way with this new job? I'm working on it. Mm. <laughs> I, I really am. Um, I, I've come into this position, as you've just said, with a very legal background. So I look at everything through a different lens than Christy Danford, who was our first director. You know, Chris, Christy was outstanding. She came in data-driven. Um, I come in no data-driven. I come in people-driven, legal, the court system. Wow. So what, how, how are you looking at the Criminal Justice Coordinated Council in, with your legal lens? Um, I'm, I'm thrilled that we're here. Let me start by that. From the very beginning, when it was first proposed in 2015 right. that we organize like this, um, I was, again, I was able to be a part of it and I was thrilled that we could do this. I'm still amazed that here we are. January, end of January 2023, and we are still doing it because, you know, we're made up of people who generally, historically, have really not had that much to do with each other. And we've been able to show through this process that when we come together and we sit down and we have facts and information and we all have that same goal, we can actually make progress. So for me, from a, from a legal standpoint, um, I'm continually impressed that we're doing this. And Judge, I know that the Charleston County Criminal Justice Coordinated Council in 2020 released a strategic plan outlining key initiatives for the next three years. The plan was developed on the heels of the CG, CJCC's efforts, obviously, in 2019 to engage and involve, as you just mentioned, over 1,200 community members in setting the plan's course. So what new results have you all received since 2020? That's a great question. Great question. Thank you for asking that. Um, what we've been able to do from that strategic plan, we've set up work groups. and. You know, everybody who participates has another full-time job. And they put aside time and energy to meet with us monthly on these work groups. So we have bond and reentry is the, one of our work groups. And what we have done is we have been able to provide the bond court judges with what we call a pretrial service report. Um, historically, bond court judges 
all they would have is criminal history and 24 hours to make a decision whether somebody needs to be detained or they can be released. So we've provided them with what we call the pretrial service reports. We have instituted defense of public defenders at bond hearings. So our bond hearings are really more informative and fair for the person being charged and for the judge who's hearing the case. Um, we have a divert and deflect work group, which focus on what can we do with these people who are constantly rotating through the system. We've identified, we call them MVPs, which actually stands for most visible persons. And these are people, Quentin, we have, we have people rotating through the detention center sometimes 10, 15, 20 times in one year. And almost always on really, really low level charges, trespassing, public disorderly conduct. Right. What can we do? And, and we're paying attention. We have our community engagement um, work group. And we have been providing, we did it for the last two years, and we're continuing to do it. A forums, a Zoom forum where anybody can sign on and be informed. Um, I have to tell you what we did in December because we were so proud of it. We provided a forum on what to do if you're charged with a crime. What was most impressive with this is that we had it in English and we had a Spanish interpreter. Because, you know, we have a Hispanic community that also needs to be informed. And we're following it up in February of this year with a Zoom program on what happens if you're the victim of a crime. And that too is going to be presented in English and Spanish. Let me break that down, Judge. You mentioned that pretrial service report. Uh, how many of those reports have you all been able to get to those magistrate judges over the past six months? Oh my goodness. So we right now are at a 96% reach rate, which I'm giving you for like last year's numbers. Sure, and, sure. and again, I'm not the number person, sure. so I'm, I'm working <laughs> from, but it is. It's really been remarkable. So if a defendant is brought in front of a bond court judge and it's a general sessions crime, which is a high level misdemeanor or a felony, that judge and the defense attorney will have a copy of their pretrial service report, which provides information and use analytics and gauges, you know, is it a level one, which is a very, very low level risk or level four, which is a much higher risk. Now, how many of those levels are really common or one that's really trending a lot in, from what you all see? Ah, so I'll do my best because, again, I, I don't have the data with me right now. The, lo the level four, which is what we call the most risk, those are, usually, those are the least number. So those are going to be individuals who are charged with violent crimes. The level one are people who, you know, are charged not with felonies. They're charged with low-level misdemeanors. They have generally no prior history of criminal activity. They live in the community. They have a job. They have a family. Um, and a bond court judge has to make a determination are they going to appear for their court cases when they're called? And whether or not are they a risk to our community? Because regardless of what we do or what we look at, our community and public safety is number one. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. So, Judge, what, what are those low-level crimes that you saw as a magistrate judge? And what are those low-level crimes that you're looking at now as the criminal justice coordinator here? Um, it's, it's, uh, let's say trespass. Mm -hmm. It is a shoplifting. It could be public disorderly conduct. It could be a uh, first charge of simple possession of marijuana. Mm -hmm. It could be, um, assault and battery of third degree, which when we talk about degrees, a sure. third degree assault and battery is, um, there's no bodily injury. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Mm. Now, now, and obviously, you know, you all have, you know, tried to tackle the issue with the low level crimes. But what are those trends that you're seeing with those low level crimes besides what you just mentioned? Um, tell me again what you're at. I'm not sure I understand what you're asking me in terms oh. of what kind of trends. Oh, no, no, no worries. Uh, obviously, you, you hear about trespassing and obviously, you know, you know, assault and battery with a first degree, second degree, third degree. But what are those other low level crimes that you're seeing on the horizon that is really becoming a trend? So, I, you know, to answer your question, we see that these crimes continue. Because let's see, we have issues in our community that every other community has. Affordable housing, transitional housing. Um, we all pay attention that there's been an increase and more attention also to mental health. And that affects so many of the people who come through the criminal justice system. Um, we have to deal with issues of um, um, substance use disorders. And again, that affects it. So until a lot of us look at it and think until we can really address housing, um, substance use disorders, mental health, things are going to continue. So Judge, who do you want to bring to the table as far as stakeholders in this community to tackle mental health and those substance abuse uh, issues? Um, we already are. Mm. I have to tell you, we have an amazing community here in Charleston. People actually care and come together to what can we do? You know, what's working in that state and that community that we can bring home? And we're already doing it. Um, it's, it's looking at, um, so instead of when somebody's on the street and let's say they're having a mental health crisis, does that person need to go to jail to be detained? Or can we bring them into what's called a Tri-County Stabilization Center where they'll have an opportunity to get the necessary attention they need? Just because somebody is having a crisis it doesn't, make them, doesn't always make them a criminal. So, Judge, I know you're not a David data driven person at all. <laughs> <laughs> but do you see, let's take for instance, here in the city of Charleston, do you see more of those people who have issues, well, have actually having, uh, had, actually had a contact, contact that is with Charleston police officers? Do you see more of those mental health uh, people going to the, that center versus jail? Um. We are seeing it increase. So mm. the answer is yes. And the reason I say that is, you know, the pandemic. Oh, yes. <laughs> that ugly COVID pandemic had such a deep impact on every system. Mm. I mean, on each of us, correct? I mean, all of us were, we were impacted by it. Sure. So the criminal justice system is no different. And it is still trying. It's moving forward. But mm -hmm. like any other system, there's a process. To answer your question, yes, I see us making improvements. And as I said, I see us coming together and really wanting to work even harder, digging deeper, move it forward. Yes, ma'am. So how has COVID even, I mean, coming up now in what, three years since that's uh, transpired? But Something, how's, yeah. Yes, ma'am. So, so how has that how is that still affecting particularly the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council? Um, it's a really good question. The, a lot of impacts, um, and it's very complex. I can tell you one of the focuses has been on what we call case processing. Mm. And that's a fancy term for when somebody's arrested and charged with a crime, what what goes on between the time they're charged with the crime until they actually go to court or the trial or the case is disposed of? Mm -hmm. um, COVID just wreaked havoc on our system. It was already complicated and difficult. Since COVID, it's even more difficult. Um, everyone 
and I and I and I really mean that everyone in the system is paying attention to case processing. What can we do to move these cases faster? You have all the necessary parties. You have the solicitor's office. You have your criminal defense attorneys, the public defender. Sure. You have our judges. You have the clerk of court. And we're all trying to put our arms around it. What can we do to move it faster? So how many cases are still sitting in a bin or a folder, for instance, right now? <laughs> Ooh, okay, so... I knew you were going to ask me some questions about data. I have a little bit of information. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, I can tell you that, so for instance, we keep up with the jail population. Sure. We do what we call the you know jail population review, which is really important because it helps all of us in the system know what's going on, right? So as of last week, the total jail population was 795 people, which is Great, because even though it sounds like a lot, our baseline when we started in 2015 was we needed to make it, lower it to 988. Mm. And here we are now at 795. So that's that's a win. Um, the average length of stay mm. is 299 days. So it's right. So, you know, these are these are issues that we are all looking, what can we do better? How can we do it better? If there was a really easy answer, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Sure. Yes, ma'am, I completely agree. So, Judge, let me ask you. Okay, we've gotten through COVID, through the grace of God, in the name of Jesus. And I know there's some still some things going on, you know, with that. But where do you want the baseline to be now that, you know, those, you know, COVID has passed and, you know, things are kind of changing in the criminal justice system? Um, as always, we'd like to continue to lower the number of the population in the jail. We'd like to reduce the average length of stay. True. And the reason, you know, when we, when we dig a little bit deeper as to why this is an issue it, it, it's, it doesn't work for anyone in the system. The longer somebody stays in jail, there's this, the, the impact on that person's family. You know, being in jail for two days is enough to jeopardize someone's job. They could be living on the edge for their rent. They're already behind on rent. They don't pay rent. They're looking at eviction. You have a family on the streets. Um, it's it's not good, it, it and so we have to we have to really look and think of what can we do so that those people who are in jail and stay in jail need to be. Let's be very clear: there are certain people that we want them to stay where they are. There are other that we want them, you know, back home and working and contributing to the community. And if they need mental health, if they need substance use um, treatment, let's get it for them. And, and Judge, what are those other impacts of staying in jail for so long besides mental health issues and losing your job or, you know, behind in rent or mortgage? It makes it difficult for all the system players. It makes mm. it difficult for the prosecutors to prosecute a case because are you going to lose your witnesses? Mm. A victim is feeling that nobody's paying attention to them. How is a victim being recognized? Um, for defense attorney, I mean, it's, it's a no win for every person involved in it. Yes, ma'am. And I, I want to go back to obviously to that. I hope I got it right. I hope I thought I was listening. But divert and reflect <laughs> work groups. Divert and deflect. Yes, deflect. sir. Deflect, that's right. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. And, and now, ex tell me exactly how many more uh, work groups do you want for that? Um, out of divert and deflect, we do crime and jail use tracking. Um, we have, let's see. I have work groups. I've got the bond and reentry, divert and deflect, community engagement, and case processing. And within each of those work groups, we have things going on. You know, we're 
So for instance, let's say bond and reentry. We're looking at what we call pretrial service options. And that's one of my that's like one of my goals one day. Okay. Soon, like this year maybe. For sure. Um South Carolina, when somebody's arrested and they have they go to bond court, the bond court judge only has two options. Is it going to be what we call a surety bond, which is a money bond, or is it going to be a PR, which is personal cognizance release? Mm -hmm. That's it. And it's it's very difficult because there are people who you want to release, but you know you're worried about them, right? If we had some kind of pretrial options, there would be a system in place that would be able to monitor this person, check in with them every week or every two weeks to make sure that they're getting um, attention, if they need help with buying, getting a job, if they need help with clothing, with home, you know, with residence, all of those things that can lift up a person so that they can still be a contributing member of our community pending their trial. And they, they don't engage in any further criminal activity, which keeps us safe. Yes, ma'am. And, uh, you know, I hear about it all the time on television, and I write about it all the time on Twitter as well. But when it comes to PR bonds and the surety bonds, what are you seeing is trending higher as far as the case processes and, you know, time in jail for most people? Um... We're going to go back to those pretrial service reports. So if somebody has what we call, again, the level one, which is the person who we really feel pretty comfortable and as certain as you can be for any one person that they're going to be at their court appearances and they're not going to engage in any criminal, you know, further criminal activity. Um, those are generally level one and level two are usually the highest levels we see. Okay, when we're, when we're processing, we have analysts who do that. The levels three and four are not as prevalent. Level four being the highest, and that's when we're talking about um, murder. That's when we're talking about armed robbery, um, burglary first degree, which are really the violent crimes. And those cases are not, the bond hearing is not in front of a magistrate. It goes to the circuit court judge. Mm. Mm. Now I know. <laughs> now, <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. So now, what? okay, since 2021, which one of those uh, higher crimes have actually, you know, been uh, trending a lot? Um, so, I mean, we all pay attention to the news and what's being put out there. And there's been a lot of attention that um, violent crime has increased, right? And the, the numbers that, that are coming out, and we only have the numbers from 2021, 2022 is not out yet. The reality is that it really has not. I mean, you're going to find outliers where there's going to be certain communities where the numbers are higher, but um, the reality is that the numbers are going to reflect something different. But, you know, when, when I say this, um, the, it, it goes back to how safe do you feel in your own community? And we can talk about the numbers increasing or decreasing, but we still know their problems. We still, you know, we still want to be able to know that we can go to the mall or the grocery store at nine o'clock at night and not worry. Or we can go to a football game or any place and not worry. Right? Yes, I mean, isn't that what this is all about? Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. Judge, so when those numbers do come out for 2022, what exactly will they say about violent crimes that are really different from 2021, 2020, even 2019? So those are going to be your, your data people who are constantly tracking it. Um, 
I am delighted to say that the CJCC, we have hired a what we call a research manager. And I'm delighted because she is brilliant. And she's going to be that person who's going to take that. And, you know, our, our job, I feel like our responsibility for the CJCC is to inform our community. That's one of our one of our responsibilities. As soon as we get those numbers, we're going to publish them. Yes. And particularly, how does that affect us here in Charleston County? Right. 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 Now, going back to 2021, Judge, where do you see violent crimes actually decreasing in what areas? Um, ah, you're going to test my memory here. So, um, the, I believe, you know what? I'm, I'm going to save myself. I'm not going to give you that answer right now. I can sure. look it up for sure. you sure. and give it to you afterwards. Sure. But at this point, sure. I'm not. I I'm not comfortable doing that. No worries. Now, since you've been in the position since August 20, 20, uh, 2022, that is. What are your other goals for this particular position and the, the organization itself? Um, um, I have so many goals. First of all. I want to continue doing what we've been doing. I, I just, I feel like this is such an amazing council. And the fact that we are continuing to move forward is so important. Um, I want to, I would really like to be able to see us continue to enlarge our engagement with the community. As good as we are, you know, having all of these really important people at the table, we need to hear from the community, the people who are living and breathing these issues. Um, we want to, um, what I would like to do is keep us moving forward and expand what we're doing. Where do you want to expand to next as far as communities and those people? So, glad you asked me that question. Um, we, several years ago, and you referenced it, we did a community engagement where we had tables all over the place. We're going to pick that up and do it again. We're going to look at that at the end of the year. Um, we are moving forward really in capturing, there's, there, you know, we have so many different levels of people, right? We have those who are the decision makers. We have those agency heads, all of these people. They've got you, you've got me. How, how do we bring us all together so that we can be heard? Take that information and vet it and, you know, sift it out and say, what, what are the real issues? I mean, I can sit here and tell you what I think the issues are. I know you can tell me what you believe the issues are. But there's a lot more to us here. Yes, ma'am. And one last question, ju uh, Judge. So what communities right now are not being heard that you want to hear from? Um, so there's a lot of communities, to be honest. Mm. I think that our Hispanic community um, has not been really fully engaged. We have an Asian community. We have communities that are outside of, say, the peninsula, West Ashley, North Charleston. Sure. You know, let's look at the islands. That's sure. part of Charleston County. Yes. yes and indeed. I believe, you know, we have a responsibility to go to them. I can't, mm -hmm. you can't expect people to always come to you. That's, you know, it's, we, we need to step out and reach out to them, which is why. So, for instance, we added Spanish interpretation in our you know, Zoom meeting, how can I expand on that? How can we do better? Mm. Yes, ma'am. And I would love to continue this I, because I know I have pet of the week coming up in 30 seconds. But Charleston County Criminal Justice Coordinating Council Director, Judge uh, Ellen Steinberg, thank you so much for your time. And again, welcome to Quentin's Full Sucks, Judge. Thank you so much. This has been a pleasure. Thank you, Quentin. Take good care. Likewise. Thank you.